morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I think the rain's got our numbers down just a little bit, but um, uh, we are here this morning. Everybody online with us as well. We're going to read the psalm that that last song we just sang was based upon, Psalm chapter 8. We'll let that call us to worship this morning. Would you read with me? Or uh, just uh, listen along. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. Will you pray with me? Our good Father in heaven, we approach your throne this morning with humble hearts, so thankful that we enjoy the good health and the opportunity you have afforded us to gather here together as your children and to study from your holy word, to sing songs of praise to you and to worship you this morning and pray that the things that we do and say here this morning are pleasing to you. We also want to pray for those who are not able to be with us this morning, dear Father. We know some are not well. Uh, They struggle with health issues and are not able to be with us. Some may be traveling. Whatever the case may be, we ask your watchful care over them. Pray that you can bring them back to us at the next appointed time. We ask, dear Father, that you will soon defeat this virus and that we will uh, no longer uh, be estranged from one another as we have been recently. Pray that we can come together soon and worship you and serve you uh, in a manner that is Uh, pleasing to you with all the freedoms that this country affords us. Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the hope of heaven we have, for the forgiveness of sins we enjoy because of his selfless sacrifice on the cross. And we look forward to his return, dear Father, when we will no longer strive together here on this earth and we will live in heaven with you forever. And we sure pray that day comes soon, dear Father. We're also thankful for your word. Until that day comes, we pray that you'll help us to uh, lean upon your word, to study it, to understand it. We might do all the things that you'd have us to do, that we might continue to be pleasing to you. Father, we pray all these things through your son, Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. Oh, my God. 
Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the feast for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold... <clears throat> The hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who is going to do this.
Memories are precious. They keep us connected to people, places, and events that have shaped us and influenced our lives. Me personally, I'm a very nostalgic person. I often like to think back to my childhood, uh, to simpler times where the worst thing that happened to me was a flat tire on my bike. There was no COVID, no bills to pay. I think fondly of the past. At the Last Supper, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples and then led them in the ancient observance of the Passover. Jesus, being the master teacher, used this opportunity to plant an important memory in his disciples and to give new meaning to the Passover. As Jesus raised the bread and the cup in thanksgiving, he added new significance to this ancient ritual. Jesus told his disciples to observe the Passover from now on in remembrance of me. Jesus took an old symbol that all Jews would be familiar with, the unleavened bread, and filled it with new meaning. Jesus' command was to remember. As today's disciples, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ. It is a little different for us though, since we weren't actually there like the apostles were. So what do we remember? We can remember the Israelites under the Old Covenant constantly having to sacrifice animals for the atonement of sins. And that Jesus is now the ultimate sacrifice whose blood washes away our sins. We can remember first. Corinthians 11.26, which says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Or John 6.51, where Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. It's interesting to think of the apostles' perspective of the Lord's Supper in the days and years after Jesus' death on the cross. Think of how real and vivid their memory must be of that day. When they partook of the supper, they could actually visualize Jesus' broken, bleeding body. And how meaningful it must have been once they fully understood why Jesus had to die. That He wasn't on the earth to save the Jews from Roman rule, but rather to save the world from sin. 
In Luke 22, Jesus shared the Passover feast with His apostles saying, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus was the fulfillment of the ancient Passover. In Exodus, God commanded the Israelites to remember that He delivered them from Egypt with the Passover meal. Likewise, Jesus instructed His followers to remember His sacrifice through the Lord's Supper. Of course, the Supper is not an end unto itself. It doesn't save us or qualify us. But rather, it points us to what does save us. That's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins. Jesus was a Lamb of God sacrificed to set us free from the bondage of sin. The cup, which rep represents His blood, covers and protects us. And the bread, His body, was broken to free us from eternal death. So let's remember these things this morning. Let's pray for the bread. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, there's so many things going on in the world, um, but right now we want to focus our minds um, to remember uh, Christ, specifically Christ on, on the cross, that He died for our sins, that His body was broken um, for us. And we're sorry that that, that had to happen, but um, we're so grateful and we want to remember that and commemorate that this morning. So we ask that you help us focus our hearts and our minds and that we would um, do this in the right way, that we would observe our, our spiritual our lives and our, and our relationship with you and that we would make changes that we need to, Father, that we would use this to grow closer to you we just thank you so much for that sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father, as we continue this memorial of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we are so thankful that He was willing to go to that cross and to give His blood that through the shedding of His blood that we might have a forgiveness of our sins. We pray that each of us as we partake of this cup this morning, which to us is symbolic of His blood that was shed for us, that we reflect back on that cross and understand the true meaning of what it means for us. We pray that we do these things in His name. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. I'm in Genesis chapter 6. I'll ask you to grab your Bible and turn over there. We're going to read a a real quick passage to give us some context for our study today. David, I'm not working this morning. It's 
give me a quick click there. Genesis chapter 6, that should have given you some time to flip over there. Genesis chapter 6, let's begin reading. Uh, right there. In verse number 5. The Bible says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now these verses that we just read are the context for one of the most, if not the most, cataclysmic event that ever happened in the history of humanity, the flood. You, you guys know right after this, God tells Noah to build an ark. He tells him, him and his family, he and his family, to get in the ark. And then God completely wipes out everything and everyone on the face of the entire world. Earth, and it tells us why. If you, in fact, if you read at the beginning of chapter six, you begin to see this really evil and corrupt picture of humanity. How uh, men were violent and they were corrupt. They were seeing things and they were taking what they wanted. They were pursuing all of these selfish things. In fact, it tells us things were so bad that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. So from God's perspective, there wasn't even any good-hearted people there that had good intentions. Every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was evil only. And this grieved God. I mean, we read this. Verse number, verse number 5 tells us, the Lord regretted that He had made man, grieved Him to His heart. And you can imagine, because... You remember what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. It was such a, a magnificent display of creation, of intimacy, where God created humanity so that He could walk and so that He could be with mankind. But then chapters 3 through 11 that this falls under are just such a, a tragic digression away from what God wanted. And so God decided something had to be done, a cleansing, a, a, a restart if you will, because humanity had gotten so far out of hand. And as we just read, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. So God has decided everything and everyone is going to be destroyed. But in the midst of this, God sees someone. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The, the Bible would go on to tell us in verse number 9, Noah was blameless in his generation. He was an upright person. He walked with God. He was an obedient man, as we'll see from this story today. In fact, God would applaud Noah's righteousness in the middle of this at the beginning of chapter 7 as Noah uh, demonstrated his faith and demonstrated this blameless character that God saw through his obedience. But, but before we chase that too far, because you guys know whenever we talk about the story of Noah, we have to talk about obedience, right? We have to talk about his character. But before we chase that too far, let's be sure not to overemphasize the moral goodness of of Noah because he was still merely a human like you and I are. In fact, after the flood episode, we're given this this really ugly episode where Noah gets drunk and he he lays there naked, he commits this this very strange act of sin. And so Noah is not someone who is perfect. He is merely human as we are. He was as much at the mercy of God as anybody else in the world during his time. And so regardless of who Noah was, regardless of how blameless he was, the emphasis as we read through Genesis 6 and 7 and read about what God has done, the emphasis is not on what Noah did or who Noah was, but rather on God working. Noah, Noah is simply the, the object of God's favor, the object of God's mercy, the object of God's working and ultimate salvation through the flood. Because you think about it, here is God who has created the world and He's decided He's going to destroy it. And how would anybody know that God was going to destroy the world if He doesn't come and reveal that to someone? You see, God could have just wiped out the whole world and not told anyone. But in His grace and in His favor, He looks at Noah and He says, I'm going to tell him what's about to happen. In this section of Scripture, 
we find the first use of the word hen, which is translated in the New King James as grace, and in most other translations it's translated as favor. This is Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And this is a word that would grow in meaning over time into a word that identified God's unfailing covenant to His people his sovereign acts of grace and salvation, it would change into the word hesed, and then later into charis, which we know as grace, which is the ultimate fulfillment of Jesus Christ in God's plan. And so it's fitting that this word is used here right before this, this act of judgment that God's about to show to the world, because this is God's first definitive act of grace. In the face of insurmountable sin, I mean the entire world is wicked and evil and degenerating away from God. In the face of insurmountable sin, that would serve as a figure of hope for future generations. Now, I want us to tuck that away because we're going to come back to that at the end of this study. But Noah, in the middle of all this, found unmerited, unwarranted favor from God to let him know what was about to happen. God's choice in this matter is what offered Noah a way to be saved from the judgment that was coming. And so how did Noah respond? Well, we know Noah was obedient to what God said. And as we talked about just a moment ago, he goes on, he builds the ark, he puts his family on the ark, he brings all of the animals just as God told him to. He gets in the boat and the flood destroys everything. But I want to draw your attention to a phrase in this episode that is repeated twice. Still not working here. A phrase that is repeated twice. And that is that Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. If you look down at the end of Genesis chapter 6, so Genesis chapter 6 is a chapter where God comes to Noah and He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build the ark. And here's how I want you to build it. He gives them very specific instructions on how it's going to look, how big it's going to be, um, what He's going to build it with. And then God tells Noah exactly what's going to happen. And as Noah is absorbing all of this information from God, it says, verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that the Lord had commanded. And then right after this, at the beginning of chapter 7, the Lord again comes to Noah and He says, Get in the ark, you and your family. And He gives him some more specific instructions about what's going to happen. And again, in Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 5, And Noah did all all that the Lord commanded him. An interesting detail throughout this episode, Genesis 6 and Genesis chapter 7, is that as God is coming to Noah and telling him about this judgment, telling him about the flood, giving him instructions about how to prepare, Noah doesn't say a word. We're not given a single word from Noah until after the flood occurs. Every command God gives, He obeys completely. He doesn't skip any steps. He doesn't alter the process. He doesn't bicker with God. He doesn't ask questions. What's going on? Help me understand. Nothing. Noah is completely silent as he obeys all that the Lord commands him. Now to me, it sure seems like Noah was smart enough to understand how this grace worked, right? God came to him. God was letting him in on what was about to happen. God wanted him to know how to prepare and how to be saved from this judgment. God gave him something, and Noah was smart enough to know, whatever God has given me, this is God's grace, and I'm going to take full advantage of it. He realized he didn't get to make the rules about this coming flood, this coming judgment. That wasn't his prerogative. That was God's place. And so he acted on every word that God told him to because I mean, who is he to decide which part was important, right? He knew something was coming. He knew judgment was coming. And so Noah did all the Lord did him, and he built the ark. And as the story plays out, uh, you know, when the floods came, Noah and his family, they were the only ones that got on the boat. They're the only ones that were saved. In fact, in other places in the Bible, we'll look at 1 Peter 3 here in just a minute, it tells us only eight people survived. Out of the entire population of the world, only eight people survived this flood, and it was the people that had obeyed all that the Lord had commanded. The story ends like this, Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 21. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, 
all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. So let me ask you a question as we reflect on this story. Why was Noah saved? Why was Noah saved? Was it because he built the ark just perfectly so that it would, would, would stand this flood that was coming? Was it because he'd come up with this plan that how he was going to survive this flood that God had told him it's coming so he came up with this plan? Well, no, you guys know none of those, that, that, that's not the answer to any of this. It was because by God's grace, he was warned and instructed what to do in order to be saved from the flood. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So we aren't given a lot of details regarding everybody else in the world during this time. But we do know some, some key details that are given to us throughout Scripture. And one is that they had a chance. We know that the rest of the people in the world had a chance to make this same choice. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 3, if you want to flip over there and look at this with me real quick, 1 Peter chapter 3, it talks about how they had a chance to obey as God's patience waited. They formally did not obey, verse number 20, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. And so the Scripture pretty clear that they had an opportunity to obey something that God wanted them to do. Presumably it would have been to obey God's commands to be saved from this. And again, we don't know how they responded to God. They obviously did not obey. But I want you to think about what that tells us. Noah is living in a world where other people have a chance to obey God. And no one else obeys. And as a result, everyone else in the world dies. You know, in the pages of our Bible, this story happens rather quickly. But in reality, from the time Noah was commanded to build the ark to the time the flood came, could have been upwards of a hundred years. We don't know the exact timeline. But it was a long period of time. People had a chance to know what was going on. In fact, Second Peter Peter would once again write and say, Noah was a herald of righteousness. It means he was proclaiming to these people, something is coming, something is happening. Not only are they seeing him building, but they're hearing him saying it, and yet no one listened. No one obeyed. Except Noah. And we don't know why. We don't know how they responded to, to Noah during that time, but however they did, we know that God allowed them enough time to learn about what was coming, and they ignored it. And I want to say all that just to say, it takes courage to do what Noah did, to do all that the Lord had commanded him, to build this boat, even though it had never rained. And people are probably looking at him like he's crazy. And people probably had all kinds of reasons why he shouldn't be doing this. Yet Noah obeyed all that the Lord commanded him. And as the writer of Hebrews reflects on this, it says that he constructed an ark for the saving of his household, and by this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Because of what Noah did, Noah was saved from the judgment that was coming. The story of Noah and the flood teaches us some really important lessons as we try to live right before God and in our world today. And, and I don't want to make a direct comparison because you know, I don't, I don't want to over-dramatize the world we live in today, but we see a lot of the same stuff Noah did, don't we? In, in our world, people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, uh, Paul would write to Timothy and say, we shouldn't be surprised that people are corrupt, that their thinking and their way of life is opposed to God. We see a lot of that, don't we? But that shouldn't lead us to apathy, but it should lead us to remember how God feels about this, these things, that, that the judgment of God is coming, that He's storing up wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed against all ungodliness, Paul would say. And ultimately, there will be a day of judgment when everyone is judged for their actions in the body. And so, regardless of how we perceive the condition of the world today, 
it shares something in common with the world in Noah's time, and that is that God's not going to let it continue. There's going to be a day of judgment that we talked about about a month ago in a lesson like this. God is not going to let the world continue. There's going to be another judgment event. And interestingly enough, as the New Testament Scriptures point forward to that future day of judgment, they often point back to the story of Noah. You remember in 2 Peter chapter 3 that we read, that we studied not too long ago. It says people will scoff and people will say, where is the evidence of His coming? When is He going to return? And they become apathetic and they act as if God is not going to destroy the world again. And Peter would write to the brethren, and he would say, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 5, they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He said, it happened in Noah's day. So then what does he say? But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. As he's looking forward, he's looking back and he's saying, because God did this before, that is evidence that God will, can and will do it again. Jesus also in Matthew chapter 24, I'll just read this one to you real quick. Matthew chapter 24 unequivocally compares the coming judgment to the flood episode. He says here in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse number 37, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came, and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. I want you to notice something critically important that he says in these verses. He says, just as in Noah's day, the ungodly are going to be unprepared in the final judgment. But it's not because they're uninformed. It's because they are unprepared and they are not obedient to all that the Lord commanded. God's judgment in the flood serves as evidence that it will happen again. And just as in Noah's day, only a few people were saved. That might be the greatest understatement in the Bible. <laughs> a few people, that is eight persons out of the entire world, were saved. And it was those who were prepared to be saved. You know, as Peter wraps all of this stuff up and as he, he reflects on it, he says, if these things are so, what sort of people ought we to be? What sort of people ought we to be? You know, I didn't plan this lesson with George, but there's a lot of parallels with what we studied in our class today in terms of what God expects from us. And all of it hinges on this idea of obeying all that the Lord commands because that's what we see from Noah, isn't it? That as he heard what God wanted him to do, he obeyed all that God told him to do. And the story of Noah is most significantly a parallel to our salvation in Christ through baptism. I mean, you guys know the verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. It says, God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So that's what happened. He says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, just like God saved Noah and his family through the flood, we are also saved through the waters of baptism. Now think about that with me for just a second. Think about this with me. Did the water save Noah? Did going through the water save Noah? No. In fact, the water was what caused the destruction of the world and everything in it. The water was the mode of God's judgment. Both the righteous and the unrighteous went through the water. Did you notice that? And only one of them came out alive. But God bought, brought Noah and his family safely through. And so the ones who were obedient to all that the Lord had commanded were the ones that were saved from this judgment. And, and so Peter, as he's reflecting on what baptism is about, he says, in the same way, baptism corresponds to this. 
This time, however, it's us who are getting in the water, right? Our spirit and our flesh are both getting into the water, into this mode of judgment, and one of them dies in the water. And one of them raises a new creature, comes to life. And this is a pattern that we see consistently from God throughout Scripture. Let me give you another example of this to to help kind of clarify. The episode of the Red Sea. In fact, as Paul is reflecting on the episode of the Red Sea, he talks about how Israel was baptized in the sea. Okay, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to think about that story of the Red Sea and what happened. So God brings Israel to the edge of the water. And He opens the water up for them. And the Israelites go into the water as they were commanded. But so do the Egyptians, right? The righteous and the unrighteous, God's people and God's enemies, both go into the water. And Israel is allowed to pass through the water, but what happens to the Egyptians? They're destroyed by the water. The water is the mode of judgment. The water made a distinction between the saved and the unsaved the alive and the dead. And in the same way, baptism creates distinction between the saved and the unsaved. It's a judgment on our old self and a putting to death of the old man. And it's an exaltation of the righteous through obedience to what God says. God wants us to be baptized in order to be saved. But in order for this to be accomplished, we must do all that the Lord has commanded us to do. And so, as we look at baptism, you know, there's a lot of people that have issues with what baptism means, what it represents, all of these things. We need to understand it's not just some ritualistic work of us earning salvation. It's an obedient decision to escape judgment. And I think that's what Peter is trying to clarify here in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 21 when he says, Baptism now... But it's not just the removal of dirt from the body. It's not just getting in there and taking a bath and scrubbing all your sins away. That is not what this is. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's a realization that if God wants me to do it, I'm going to do it and I'm going to obey God because He is bringing judgment and I want to escape that judgment. Baptism is not our idea. It's God's idea. It's God's method of judging the unrighteous and saving His people. And so it's not the water that's anything special as we get into the waters of baptism, but it's the preparation of the person as they get into the water. It's an understanding that obedience to what God has graciously revealed to me is what saves me from my sins. I would have no idea how to be saved from my sins if God had not revealed it to me. And so that's why as we look at the example of Noah and we see that Noah did all that the Lord had commanded, we too should do all that the Lord had commanded. You know, we know from other passages the implications of, of baptism. It's, it's when I die like Christ and I raise to walk a new life. But as it pertains to the story of Noah, it's all about plugging into grace through obedience. Just as Noah obeyed all that the Lord had commanded, so we too are expected to obey all that the Lord commands us. Jesus expects us to do that, which includes baptism. You know, Jesus' famous last words right here that I have on the screen. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And this is important. I don't want this to be a reactionary lesson, but we need to acknowledge this. This is important because today many people deny the necessity of baptism in the salvation process. People say things like, it's a work. It's just something you're doing to earn your salvation. It's a representation of what's going on. In fact, if you Google baptism and you read what people are saying about it, many religious writers will just come out and say, baptism does not save you which is a direct contradiction to what Peter says. Baptism now saves you. We need to understand how foolish it is to reject such a direct command from God. Baptism does save us. But it's not just about getting in the water. I mean, none of us believe that, right? I can't just go grab somebody off the street and say, hey, I got some water, get in it, you're saved. We don't believe that, right? It's not just putting people under the water that saves people. There are prerequisites to it that people need to understand 
to understand God's grace, what God did through Jesus Christ, how He saves us from our sins so that people can respond in faith. And so it's a process, but it's a process that includes baptism. And that's what Peter is trying to say. It's all a cumulative process where we observe all that the Lord has commanded us to do. And so if we're going to do that, if we're going to take the example of Noah, and we're going to obey the instructions of Jesus to observe all that He has commanded us, we need to acknowledge that baptism is part of the process. We can't leave it out. We just cannot leave it out. At the end of the day, none of us came up with the idea of baptism. The Scriptures clearly include baptism in every conversation about salvation. And so instead of explaining it away, maybe we ought to take a page out of Noah's book and just keep our mouth shut and do all that the Lord has commanded us. Because judgment is coming. Another day of judgment is coming. And salvation, as it was in Noah's day, salvation is God's prerogative. And God has graciously revealed how to be saved from our sins. So why are we quibbling about the logistics of it? Why don't we just do what God has asked us to do? In fact, instead of making baptism a point of controversy, a better conversation would be, are we willing to listen to what God says and do it? (laughs) Because that, that to me seems to be the real issue that all of us struggle with, isn't it? Are we going to do all that the Lord has commanded us to do? You know, if it's in this book, am I willing to do it? And I'm not just talking about baptism. I'm talking about everything. About the way that we treat others. About the way we behave in relationships. About the way that we honor God and the way we go about our ministry in this world. Am I willing to do all that the Lord has commanded us? Because at the end of the day, that's what differentiates the saved from the lost whether or not we do what we know God says. And that's why I think the most fundamental and important principle in Scripture is found in the book of Hebrews when he says, today if you hear His voice, don't harden your hearts. Because if we're not willing to listen and to obey what God says, we are rejecting the grace of God that He has given to us in plain language. Now there may be some difficult things to understand. We talked about that in class today. But we can if we wrestle with them. But there are also some things in Scripture that are pretty plain. Baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Are we committed to doing that? To doing all that the Lord has commanded us? That's what baptism represents in the life of believers. And really, that's a pattern that we replicate the rest of our lives. We hear what God says, we do it to the best of our ability with humility as a way of honoring God. Listen, if you've never put on Christ in baptism, you will not be saved. And I believe most of us here this morning have done that. We've put on baptism. But that needs to be the message that we are speaking to the world as we're trying to get people into Christ, into this saved relationship. Baptism now saves you as an appeal to God for a good conscience. This culmination of everything you know about God brings you to this point where you do all that the Lord has commanded you. And so for those of us who have made that decision, we need to revisit that choice. We need to revisit that commitment. Am I still committed to doing all that Jesus commands? And listen, I'll tell you guys, as long as I'm given this podium, I'll make it my goal to stir us, to be honest about that. Are we really doing everything that God has commanded us to do? Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't been as faithful in your determination to do what's right. That's serious business. We need to repent. If that is you this morning, you need to repent and you need to do what the Lord is calling you to do. Do what you know is right. That's the Lord's invitation. If I can help you and encourage you in any way, I'm going to be down here at the front. Come and talk to me while we stand, while we sing the song.
Daniel, thank you for those thoughts. I think about that appeal for a good conscience. I think about Acts 2 when those people were stood guilty for crucifying Jesus, wanting to know what they did. They were asking that question, right? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Appreciate those thoughts. Hope you think about those later and you need to make a change in your life. We've already gone from here. You certainly can call one of us. Heaven's invitation is extended always, day and night. Not just while we're here together. So please reach out to us if you um, feel like you need to uh, after we leave here. Let's remember those who uh, are not with us this morning. Uh, there are plenty that are not feeling well still. Please uh, look at the Monday Minute as it comes out tomorrow. Uh, for those that need our prayers, keep them in your prayers. And um, let's continue to serve one another and love one another. And uh, let's see, is there anything else that I need to... I think mention of the meal was... Oh, the meal is for the Vincent. So Baby Jacks is here, as we mentioned last week. Um, and there is a meal list out there. I think it was emailed out to everyone if you want to get on there. I think this coming week's taken care of. Yeah, I'm going to resend it tomorrow. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So um, uh, if you want, if it's one way you can help serve uh, our brethren here. So and pray for them. Uh, what else? Anything else I'm missing? So um, if nothing else, remember your daily reading this week. I think we continue in Psalms. Uh, so we're going to finish up the year in Psalms. So uh, if there's nothing else at this time, if you'll remain standing, we'll uh, have our closing prayer. And please remain standing afterwards for the closing Psalms. Let's pray. Father, we come to you at the end of this worship, this assembly. We're thankful to have gotten to be here and to enjoy fellowship. Uh, this year has helped us to appreciate that blessing maybe more than ever. And so we're thankful for that. We're thankful for all those who uh, have joined us virtually as well. And we're thankful for the fellowship that we all share. And, um, and for this church, that is um, a conduit of faith and um, your word knowledge of you. We're thankful for Jesus and um, for his sacrifice for us. And uh, we pray that you keep the cross in front of us from day to day. Help it to shape our perspective and uh, your grace. And help us to extend that same grace to others wherever we can. Father, in a year full of division, Help us to be peacemakers. Again, to show your grace wherever we can. We pray that you be with each of us as we go into this week. Help us to be salt and light. In Jesus' name, amen.